you often hear people harking back to the 50s in both nostalgic and comparative ways. And I think that there is something to that, especially if you just sort of look at the surface. But fundamentally, I think we're really in a very different time. And the analogy of the box that you mentioned, I think, is, is really quite perfect. There was a box for everyone. And uh, it was pretty tight. There wasn't a lot of room to move in. There was a box if you were a woman. There was a box if you were a man. There was a box if you were a teenager and a child, a young adult. And there were roles you had to play at every stage, depending on your age, your gender, your class. Primarily, a man was supposed to be responsible with a capital R. Responsibility fell so heavily on men. And on some level, we forget, because our uh, view, good or bad, of that era has focused so much on women's roles, we forget that there was no shared responsibility. The notion of the family wage, the notion of the breadwinner, the notion of the head of the household. The father was supposed to be in charge, in control, taking care of everyone. Uh, it was true, of course, that one of the roles of the woman was to take care of the emotional needs of the man. But it certainly wasn't true that there was any other sense of, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. That's the, uh, that's the, uh, <laughs> Do we start over? <laughs> no, I'm going to stop in place I can use. The um, Cut. <laughs> I asked you a question about that before we get off the husband or the father. Uh, was he disciplinary, and I want to ask you, and at the same time, didn't the mother work? Well, that's a really good question. The mother worked only in a supportive economic role. The mother worked to enable the family to achieve a standard of living that perhaps the father couldn't do alone. So there was this myth on the one hand of the self-sufficient breadwinning father, and yet this was the time, for the first time in the, in the nation's history, that a vast minority of married women were in the paid labor force. It was a huge number compared to anything that had ever come before, uh, and everyone was doing it, and on some level no one was talking about it. Uh, men felt embarrassed and guilty if their women were working. Um, women insisted that they were really career homemakers and just held the job on the side either to supplement the family income or for a little diversion when the children were in school. A lot of these jobs were part-time. They were very rarely put in the terms of careers. Um, a, a lot of white middle-class women talked about the homemaking role as their primary career and used that word quite forcefully. But what this meant for the man was that uh, even though he was supposed to be the breadwinner and taking care of everyone, here were all these wives out there working because the breadwinner really couldn't do it alone. It was the big, deep, dark, dark secret that everyone knew about and everyone was living with. So um, that was one piece of the male role that was really, I think, uh, problematic for a lot of men. Another part of the male role was uh, was the sort of discovery of the daddy in the 50s. Um, there had always been fathers, <laughs> but daddies were sort of new. And uh, the popular culture everywhere was telling men how to be dads, how to uh, help out when the babies were little, teaching them how to bathe a child, change a diaper, give a bottle. Um, when dad comes home, it's his turn. Um, then there was also be a chum teach your kids how to fix the car, show them how to work in the basement, um, which in a funny way assumed that men had all of these skills, which of course they didn't necessarily have, but somehow they had to acquire them to be able to transmit them in a very gender-specific way to their children. I think the 50s particularly was a really hard time for men, a hard time for them to find any emotional connection within their lives to anything that they did. Work was, by and large, either very routine or very high-pressured, where the, um, the emphasis on success and on bringing home enough money to be able to achieve the standard of living that was expected at the time was very, very powerful, very intense. Uh, and from what men were saying at the time in their deepest, most innermost uh, private thoughts to themselves was, um, why am I doing this? And the answer was, for their families. And there's a, a lot of evidence of this, and it's very moving and poignant, and it's very hidden, because you didn't have writers like Betty Friedan who talked about the male mystique. Uh, but you did have men who responded to Betty Friedan's book who said, 
hey, what about me? This hasn't been easy for us either. And so I think the daddy role, the family man, uh, although there were pressures there too, and it was, again, it was one of these pretty small boxes where men didn't have a lot of room to maneuver. It was at least a place where there was room for some emotional satisfaction, where there was really some room for, uh, from a real connection to other people, a real sense of belonging, sense of need. How many men felt really needed on their jobs? They had work to do, but when they came home, uh, there was a place where there was really some connection, some emotional uh, community that they could feel. And I, and I think raising children and being the daddy uh, was an important role for men. I, I wouldn't downplay it. I'm not sure v very men at the t many men at the time were very good at it or that they really knew how to do it very well or had much time for it. But I think that when men talked about working hard to support their families, I think they meant that, and I think they meant it in more than an economic way. Uh, parents gave their children two different kinds of messages. One was the stated and explicit message, and the other was a kind of subterranean message. And I think if we want to talk about the seeds of the 60s and the 50s, the subterranean message was somewhat more powerful, because what children saw was the dissatisfactions in their parents. They saw their parents saying one thing and expressing something different. They saw that the fathers were not that all happy with their success, their affluent lives, their um, playing by all the rules. They saw that their mothers were even less happy with the kind of boxes that, that they were expected to survive within and be happy within. Um, when uh, a lot of women and men who grew up in those families are asked about their family lives, you'll hear some strange things, as I'm sure you have, which is things like, well, I grew up in the typical suburban family. My father worked hard and brought home, you know, the paycheck, and we lived pretty comfortably, and my mother was a full-time housewife, and that seemed to suit her. But when I was in high school, my mother had a nervous breakdown. And that kind of thing comes out over and over again, the kind of hidden side, um, drugs. We think about drugs as a 60s phenomena, but Middle-class American housewives were drug addicted throughout the 50s. Barbiturates, um, tranquilizers, alcohol, uh, anything to, to try to relieve and ease the pain of these, of these enormous um, expectations on women to be happy in this very, very narrow, confined existence. The parental generation wanted self-fulfillment through personal relationships. They wanted self-fulfillment through sex. They wanted self-fulfillment through having children. Uh, and the route they thought to get to that happy state of personal bliss was to get married young so then you could have this kind of sexual ecstasy in your relationship and have children that would fulfill you and have that uh, warm, romantic, uh, hopefully excited relationship stay with you for the rest of your life. Uh, by the time the children came of age, the same goals were still there, but somehow the children saw that it hadn't really worked for the parents. They still wanted exciting sex, just like their parents had. They still wanted fulfillment through those close relationships between men and women, or between women and women, and men and men. The idea of what made a, a, an erotic, satisfying relationship was no longer defined as marriage, necessarily maybe later, perhaps with children. But if they, like their parents, were looking for sexual excitement and personal fulfillment through a relationship, an eroticized personal relationship, what they dropped was the marital imperative. But obviously, they didn't drop it forever. And most, like their parents, eventually got married, not once, but maybe twice or three times. I mean, they certainly didn't lose interest in marriage. They did it a lot. <laughs>